What the hell is your delay, Captain? We're waiting, sir. Waiting for what? Private Doss. Who the hell is Private Doss? I always dreamed about being a doctor, but I uh, didn't get much school. I can't stay here while all them go fight for me. But you figure this war is just going to fit in with your ideas? While everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. And that's going to be my way to serve. This is a personal gift from the United States government designed to bring death to the enemy. Oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't touch a gun. She don't kill. No, sir. You know, quite a bit of killing does occur in war. Private Doss does not believe in violence. Do not look to him to save you on the battlefield. I don't think this is a question of religion. I think this is cowardice. I'll fall in love with you because you weren't like anyone else. You're saying you could go to prison. But I don't know how I'm going to live with myself if I don't stay true to what I believe. With the world so set on tearing itself apart, doesn't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. Private Doss, you are free to run into the hellfire of battle without a single weapon to protect yourself. I'm gonna get you home. There's something you gotta see. Who did this? That's the card. We have to go back up tomorrow. And they're not gonna go up there without you. Help me. You'll have to trust me. You better come home to me. Please, Lord. Help me get one more. Let me get one more. All right, week two, God of the Movies, Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, this is an annual series that we do as uh, we look for uh, the spiritual truth about God and our relationship with him. And God is a reminder for, uh, God of the Movies is a reminder for us that, that first of all, there are a lot of ways um, to get into a conversation about God. I think that's a good reminder. Like, you don't just have to find God in the Bible. You know, oftentimes, it's not, the Bible's not the best place to start because the people that we interact with may not even hold the Bible as anything meaningful in their own lives. And so this is a, a great example of where we can start because God's, God's a whole bunch of places. And then God speaks to us through surprising channels. And uh, I think the question for us is, do we have our ears open to hear what he might have to say? And uh, so we started this off, series off last week with uh, like a really surprising place for a lot of us where God might speak in the movie Doctor Strange. And uh, today we're going to go to a movie that is based on a true story. I think that we are moved by the stories of men and women uh, who inspire us to a higher purpose. This is one of the movies that I saw this past year based on a true story uh, that just was so inspiring, not only because of the character in it, but also because I had never heard this story before. And I thought, man, how could like such a, an amazing person and, and an amazing act uh, not be known widely in the fact that I didn't know who he was? The other movie that struck me that way, honestly, uh, it was shocking to me, was the movie Hidden Figures. If you haven't seen that movie, we don't, we're not doing it for this year, but gosh, it is such a good movie uh, because it, it deals with the same thing about these, um, what I love about it is it's that it's just normal men and women who are making a difference and in both of those cases in an extremely countercultural way without being weird. Anyway, I love it. I'm inspired by it and I'm really glad that we get to talk about it today. Uh, Hacksaw Ridge, uh, this film was nominated for Best Picture. And uh, the movie also received an Academy Award nomination for Mel Gibson, who apparently is back. Mel Gibson's back and doing things. Um, and so uh, for the second week in a row, we have this film that was 
created uh, uh, by a, or directed by this committed Christian, a committed Christian director, both last week for Doctor Strange and this week for uh, Hacksaw Ridge. But in neither case would we consider these movies Christian movies. You know what I mean? And so I, I love that, and I wanna, I wanna bring that out a little bit. Um, both of these men uh, are seeking to inspire and bring truth and bring that out through their work and through their art, uh, but that they wouldn't fall into our usual Christian categories, which I love and I think is meaningful to our lives. On one of the DVD extras that comes with this movie, Mel Gibson says that he looks for three things uh, when he chooses a film, and he calls them his three E's. It has to entertain. I mean, obviously, like if you're going to do a movie, it should be entertaining. Uh, it has to educate, which I think is interesting. That's an interesting value that he holds, and it has to elevate. So, so for him, it has to entertain, educate, and it has to elevate. As he puts it, it has to lift you to a higher spiritual dynamic. And I think that you see that if you examine his films like uh, Braveheart, uh, The Passion of the Christ, uh, Apocalypto, and then this film, I think he really uh, hits that mark again of entertainment, education, and elevation. Uh, I will be the first to admit that Hacksaw Ridge is a study in contradiction. You've yet to see the movie. Uh, there's a lot of tension in the movie. Uh, perhaps it's, it's fitting that the, the title of the film is Hacksaw because in, in a lot of ways, this movie is just like jarringly cut in half, like literally. Uh, the first is that the film is structured in two parts. The first half of the film is in uh, rural America. It's set in rural America. It's, it, it's at the homes and the army bases and, and the courtrooms. It's kind of relative civilization uh, at the time. And then the second half of the film is set in Okinawa in World War II. Far from civilization and from love and peace, it's relative chaos. Uh, and so the shift happens exactly like midway through the point of the film. And that's intentional. It is, it is, it is bloody. It, it, it is bracing. Um, the, this movie depicts the, the pivotal battle of Hacksaw Ridge that occurred in April and May of 1945. And the film's brutal second half, and it is brutal, contains some of the most... Um, graphic uh, and well choreographed uh, cinematic battle scenes that are remindful of Saving Private Ryan. That opening, you know, that opening scene that just kind of set itself apart in, in Saving Private Ryan. Um, let me just say, some people might be surprised, like why would you use an R, this is an R-rated film, why would you use an R-rated film in church? And I think that's a fair question to ask, but this is how I look at it. Uh, you always have to judge the content of a movie by its context. So what is it there for? Is it there for titillation or is it there for truth? And uh, the reality is, is that life can be very hard. And truth does not shy away from that fact. The Bible certainly doesn't. I mean, if, if you were to use the Bible as a, as a shooting script, consider the passion of the Christ or any other story in there, I mean, you'd be lucky to come away with just an R rating if you just tried to set the Bible to film. Uh, and and it, the, that's just the way that life is. A war movie, in my opinion, should be bloody because the taking of human life is a horrible thing. And we should feel that. That's what makes the impact of the, the, the D-Day invasion and saving Private Ryan um, so impactful. It, it's not only that it was just, it's more realistic, but in some ways it's more moral to put a film that way than, for instance, maybe one of uh, an older film like The Longest Day by John Wayne, who's, you know, in that film he is kind of standing on the beach, heroic, you know, come on, boys. Uh, and, it, and it glorifies war without showing the true cost of war. Anyone that tries to sell you a product but hides the price is probably a crook. And so if you're going to film a war movie, then film a war movie. War is hell, they say. Uh, and Hacksaw Ridge doesn't hide that fact. The first half of the film has this, uh, it just, uh, 
I don't know how, I mean, I'm, I'm not a film guy. I don't know how they do it, but it has like this pastoral tone to it, even just in how the picture looks. It's, it's very sunny and vibrant. It's almost soft, like blurred edges kind of deal, like just the way the film looks, and it, it looks more peaceful that way. And then kind of halfway through that point, it becomes very uh, industrial and mechanical. It becomes very uh, muddy and hellish and, and gray. And then there's also this second kind of division in the film. And this one's more theoretical than literal because the, the hero of the war film is not a warrior. This is the story of Desmond Doss. He is an Appalachian farm boy who due to his uh, upbringing uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, who are that, that particular strain of Christianity, are pacifists. He is a conscientious objector is the term for it. In America, uh, a nation largely founded on religious groups kind of fleeing persecution, there has always there's been this recognized constitutional right. The U.S. military officially defines conscientious objection as a firm, fixed, and sincere objection to participation in war in any form or the bearing of arms by reason of religious training and or belief. If you can demonstrate that your religious conscience uh, has this conscientious objection to it, then you have the right to sit out in armed conflict in America. And Desmond Doss could have done that. He, but he didn't want to sit it out. His brothers and his friends were fighting and dying for freedom, and he wanted to serve. And his beliefs just didn't allow him to kill. Many conscientious objectors do serve in the military as cooks, uh, truck drivers, support personnel. Doss wanted to be on the field as a combat medic. As he says, he says, I want to save lives, not take them. Which again, is all perfectly legal, but as we see in the film, that doesn't necessarily sit well with the, the troops in the trenches. And the first half of the film really sets up this tension. And here's just one scene. Uh, they're out on the firing range where the sergeant makes clear his views about Doss's beliefs. Gentlemen, I want you to meet Private Desmond Doss. Apparently, Private Doss does not believe in violence. He does not practice violence. He will not even deign to touch a weapon. You see, Private Doss is a conscientious objector. So I plead with you, do not look to him to save you on the battlefield, because he will undoubtedly be too busy wrestling with his conscience to assist. Sarge, that's not Private, true, Sarge. As you were. Now, I realize some of you might have strong feelings about this. It is what we men fight for, to defend our rights, to protect our women and children. Even if Private Doss's beliefs might cause women and children to die. So I will expect everyone in this company to give Private Doss the full measure of respect he is due for the short time he will be with us. Am I clear? Yes, yes Sergeant! Got here, Desi. You know what that is? It just seems kind of small. <laughs> it's half the Bible for half the man. For Pete's sake, Smitty, give him back his Bible. I remember speaking to you. It's how come you don't fight? Or you think you're better than us? No. But what if you was attacked? like that. Doss endures a tremendous amount of persecution, physical, emotional, even legal persecution, as a result of his beliefs. But through it all, he does not waver. And finally landing on the shores of Okinawa, embedded with his combat regiment. All this leads to what 
the, the second kind of less literal division within Hacksaw Ridge. What do you do with a film about pacifism that ends up being this bloody war epic, as bloody as any war epic in recent memory? Is Gibson, the director, glorifying violence here, even as he tells the story of a non-violent hero? I mean, that's the perspective of, of some of the film reviews that, that came back with this. And it's kind of a, a similar question that was leveled for at Gibson when he was directing The Passion of Christ, which juxtaposes these images of, you know, the flesh being ripped from Jesus while he utters lines like, love your enemies, and those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Can a film's point about non-violence, about sacrifice and, and love be effectively made by confronting the audience kind of so bluntly and unapologetically with the gory horror of violence? And this is the other, the duality uh, of Hacksaw Ridge, the thematic duality. And it's a complicated question. The question of pacifism and Christianity is not a simple one. Uh, I know for many of us here today, uh, you've either served uh, or you have a family member that has served in the military. And so the question about pacifism and how that interacts with our views as Christianity is, is not easy. For some people, they would argue that Christian pacifism is just an unrealistic standard. Like, yeah, I mean, that's probably what Jesus meant, but it's just not that practical. And while I agree that pacifism is idealistic, what kind of argument is that? I mean, like, the Christian sex ethic is pretty idealistic too, you know? Sex with one person after you're married. That's a pretty idealistic standard. Does every Christian hold to that standard? Of course not. And are we gracious? Yes, but we don't change the standard. Following Jesus isn't easy. But it's pacifism. Is that a Christian standard? Well, for that, I, I think that's debatable. But it seems to me that it's, it's one of those, uh, how, the Apostle Paul, writer in the Bible, puts it as a matter of conscience. There are just some things that the Holy Spirit says are okay for some people and that are not okay for other people. Not everything. I mean, some things are clearly sin. It's clearly laid out. But some things aren't necessarily sin. And that's why legalism never works in Christianity. Because there's no, rule keeping is no substitute for hearing from the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't work like that. The reality is there have always been Christians associated with the military, even in the third century. Uh, so we're talking the year 200. Uh, some very early church fathers, guys named uh, Tertullian and Origen. Man, those names need to come back. Like, when are you going to see those in top Navy names again, right? Tertullian and Origen. Uh, they were writing uh, about, and they, they took opposing views on, on pacifism. Some of the earliest Christian symbols on gravestones have been found in Roman military cemeteries. Um, one of the oldest Christian churches that we know of was excavated in a, a place called Megiddo in Israel uh, in the late 1990s. And this is so fascinating. Uh, the church was built in the back of a room inside a military fortress that served two legions of Roman troops. And on the floor, there's this mosaic that depicts uh, two fish as a symbol of Jesus and an inscription that talks about the table to God, Jesus Christ, as a memorial. And so there were obviously enough soldiers in the army at this base to have a Christian church in it. Now remember, at this time, it's actually illegal to be a Christian in Rome, but apparently, for large stretches of time, the, the army maintained a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy with regards to the religious orientation of their soldiers, and especially good ones. Now, there were seasons of persecution uh, back then, just, just like with DOS. Being a Christian in the military uh, could put a target on your back. From 285 AD, the emperor Diocletian had doubts about the loyalty of his troops, and so he decided to purge the army of Christians. And the problem with Christian soldiers was that they refused. Not to fight, but they refused to worship the emperor as God. They were fine to die for the emperor, 
they, they had no problem doing that. Just not worship him. Because they only worshiped Jesus Christ. And we have numerous stories of Christian martyrs uh, during this time. One of them was Julius the Veteran. It's a pretty good name. Julius the Veteran. He had served for, with distinction for 27 years across seven campaigns. Most soldiers at this time uh, only survived one or two campaigns at the most. And so he was a legendary soldier. And he was a Christian. And some of his fellow soldiers ratted him out to his superiors. We don't know why. Maybe some jealousy, maybe a chance to take his place, move up in the ranks. But they, they made public charges, and the officers were forced to deal with it. They even quietly bribed Julius to renounce Jesus. And if he would do that, then they would let him go home and, and let him spend the rest of his life kind of on a, on a nice farm. But he refused. And just as publicly confessed his faith in Christ. And the chief officer, facing the loss of you know, status among his men, if he couldn't get one soldier to obey, ordered Julius immediately beheaded and seven more soldiers who decided to stand up for him. He wouldn't leave his faith, but he wouldn't leave the army either. And there's a whole lot more like Julius. Some fought. Others, like Doss, didn't. But there have been Christians serving in every war for the last 2,000 years. So I don't think it's a black and white issue whether or not to be a soldier, whether or not to engage in pacifism. I, I think you've got to be able to hear, for God, hear from God for yourself. And, and I think that's what this movie, movie so beautifully portrays. Desmond Doss heard from God, and he had the courage to obey what he heard. You see that in this scene where he's pinned down in the confusion of a horrific battle on the top of the ridge. Doss heard from God in the wounded men's cries for help. And in response, he heads out to the battlefield to drag them back to safety, one after another. It's a nightmare of a scene. There are still Japanese troops patrolling and killing the wounded stragglers. But all through the night, Doss returns to the front bloody and exhausted to save more men. There's a powerful scene. It's a, it's a true scene that shows him praying all through his ordeal. One more, Lord. Let me save one more. One more. With God's help, Desmond Doss rescued 75 men off the top of that ridge in that one night. For his heroism, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. The first conscientious objector to ever receive that honor. It's an amazing story that you would, I mean, you just have a hard time believing it, even that it's, it's true. It's very inspiring. You see, while I don't think the Bible tells you whether or not to be a soldier, I do think it tells you what kind of soldier to be. So I just want to look at a quick story 
of some hero warriors from the life of King David. If you have a Bible, you can turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. That's where we're going to be hanging out today and uh, looking at this story in David's life. David had this elite bodyguard of men, about 30 to 40 men. They were hand-picked warriors that defended him, and they were known as David's mighty men. The Hebrew word is giborim. You know, these are like SEAL Team 6 kind of guys. These are the elite of the elite, the cream of the crop uh, when it comes to warriors. And so in this story that occurs, Israel has been invaded by the Philistines, who are their kind of arch enemy at the time. And they've actually, the Philistines have actually captured the capital city and they forced David to flee for his life. And that's where we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 13. Once during the harvest, when David was at the cave of Adullam, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephaim. The three, who were among the 30, an elite group among David's fighting men, went down to meet him there. David was staying in the stronghold at the time, and a Philistine detachment had occupied the town of Bethlehem. So Abdullah is this cave that David and his men had used back when they were outlaws, uh, back when they were running from Saul, back before David had become king. And now they're back, David and his three mighty men. But that's not where you want to be <laughs> when you're used to being king. Nobody wants to find themselves back in the cave. You're sitting in this musty old cave when the enemy has your palace back in Bethlehem. And so David is feeling kind of blue. He's feeling down about it. And that's when he says this in verse 15. David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love some of that good water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem. Now, here's the, he, he's not having an issue, uh, he, or he's not issuing a command, right? This is not a command. This is just kind of sighing out loud. And he's not thirsty. I mean, he's not physically thirsty. I mean, they had supplies. They had a stockpile of supplies at Adullam. It's not a matter of thirst. It's not a matter of command. No. What he wants is he just wants water from his hometown well. Bethlehem was his home, and it was just a few miles away. But here David is sitting in a cave. What kind of warrior or what kind of king can't get water from his hometown well? Well, a loser king. That's who. I mean... So these three warriors, they overhear their king, who's just kind of down in the dumps, depressed about it. And they're like, hey, man, you're, you're, no, you're not going to be no loser king on our watch. Like, we don't serve no loser king. And so they geared up, and this is what they did in verse 16. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew some water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem, and brought it back to David. Now, here's what we know. The gate of Bethlehem was at the top of a hill. And so when it says that a Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem, we know that there's probably at least 20 men in a garrison, maybe a little bit more. And so these three men had to fight their way uphill, cut their way through overwhelming numbers, three versus 20 or more. And probably while two of them are kind of fighting the other guys off, one of them is trying to fill up some water skin to bring the water back to David. I mean, this is this is like a strip for Mel Gibson. But I want you to see what David does, because this is an important part. How does he respond to the three heroes that risk their lives to serve the king? Here's how the story finishes. But he, David, refused to drink it. They brought it back. David refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. The Lord forbid I should drink this, he exclaimed. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David did not drink it. These are examples of the exploits of the three. Now, it may not look like much to us, but David is making a statement. Two really important statements, actually. When he refuses to drink the water. When David pours it out to God, he is turning the water into a drink offering. That's what it's doing. That's what it's called. And, and this is making statements that are completely contradictory 
to the warrior, warrior culture, both then and, and now. First of all, David refuses to give them glory for what they've done. In ancient cultures, I mean, listen, to go fearlessly against overwhelming odds in obedience and in loyalty to your captain and to come back victorious is the ultimate kind of glory. That's what you make movies about. But by pouring it out, David's saying, this isn't your water. This isn't my water. God accomplished this. You didn't accomplish this. You went and you came back, but the glory doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. That's what an offering is. It's a way of returning thanks back to God. When I give part of my income back to God every week, it's my way of acknowledging that everything I have comes from him anyway. And so you see what David is saying to his warriors. Yes. Yes, guys, I know you are bold and you are brave. You are also 6'4", 220 pounds of muscle. But who made you that way? Who gave you the hand-eye coordination to develop the skills that you did? Besides, I don't care how great your warrior skills are. It just takes one arrow. It only takes one little pebble on the ground in the wrong place, and you slip and you fall and you're dead. The only reason you got that water and came back was God. There's this clip of an actual interview with Desmond Doss shortly before he died. And it's just striking how clearly he gives thanks to God for everything that happened to him. He knows that all, by, by all rights, by all odds, he should have died on that ridge many times over. So the first thing David's drink offering does is it, 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 it points to a heart of gratitude. Do you do that in your life? No matter what you've accomplished. Maybe you're a corporate warrior. Salesforce hero, a nursing phenom. Be sure to pour out your blessings to God. Somebody said praise is like perfume. It's wonderful to take a whiff, but you wouldn't want to swallow it. It's exactly what David is doing here. He says, when praise comes to you, you need to pour it out praise comes to you, you need to pour it out. But with that drink offering, David's not just saying, hey, be careful about praise, be careful about taking it and letting it rot in your guts, spiritually speaking. He's also saying to those men, to those warriors, your ultimate allegiance can't be to me. You have to look beyond me. You have to look above me. You have to look to the one that I represent, the one that I'm pointing to, the only ultimate allegiance anyone can have is to the Lord. My favorite scene in the movie takes place after Doss comes down from his heroic night of rescue. He washes up, and then the captain comes to see him. This is the same captain that oversaw his persecution back at the boot camp. And through this scene, we see that the real accomplishment of Doss's faith was to point other men forward to the true hero. Let's take a look. Well, I saw was a skinny kid. I didn't know who you were. You've done more than any other man could have done in the service of his country. Now, I've never been more wrong about someone in my life. I hope one day you can forgive me. that tomorrow is your Sabbath.
Most of these men don't believe the same way you do. But they believe so much in how much you believe. And what you did on that ridge is nothing short of a miracle. And they want a piece of it. And they're not gonna go up there without you. Waiting, sir. Waiting for what? For Private Doss to finish praying for us, sir. Private Doss is praying for you. Who the hell is Private Doss? Go to work. It's an amazing scene. They may not believe in what you believe in, but they believe in how much you believe. Do people say that about us? Are we like David? Like Desmond Doss, pointing to something beyond us. See, when David refuses to drink the water of these men's sacrifice, he's demonstrating that he's ultimately not worthy of it. But wait, he's a king. Yeah, yeah. But David knows that there's another king coming. There's another David, a, a greater David who would climb up a hill and win for his people water, not just from any well, but water from the river of everlasting life. One of Jesus' final words on the cross was, I thirst on the cross. Jesus Christ experienced the cosmic thirst that we, so, so that we could have the water of life. In other words, he knew the water that we really needed. He went into battle, and not at the risk of his own life, but at the cost of his life. Not a symbolic blood poured out on the ground, but real blood, his own blood, poured out on the ground. He got the water that we needed. He got what we needed uh, to know so that God, to, he got what we needed to know God is for us. And to fill our lives and to flood our lives with hope and assurance. And he was like these warriors. He went fearlessly. He went loyally. He went aggressively. And he devastated evil on the cross. That's what it says in Colossians 2.15. When Paul says this, he says, In this way he, Jesus, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them. The point is that the cross was a victory. The cross was a battle. In the cross, he aggressively devastated evil. But look how he did it. Not by taking power, but by losing power. Not by taking glory, but by losing all of his glory. Not by taking command, but serving everybody. Not by devastating the people in which the evil resided, but by devastating evil itself, by refusing to engage in it. There's a scene in the film where Doss is in jail. This is before he goes out to a war. He's in jail. He's awaiting the court-martial. And, and his captain is trying to talk some sense into him. Doss says that he's not willing to kill, but he's willing to lay down his life for his fellow soldiers. And the captain says, nobody ever won a war by giving up their life. But actually, that's exactly what Jesus did. Therefore, what we have in Jesus Christ is a revolution. It's this whole new way of doing everything. 
Do we get this? Do we see how revolutionary this is? The gospel tells us that we were enemies of God. I mean, when, when you watch the war movies, when you and I watch the war movies, why don't we identify with the enemies? I mean, that's what the Bible says that we were, the enemies of God. But on the cross, Jesus destroyed the evil in us without having to destroy us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And if you take that to the center of your life, it will turn you into a warrior against evil. You won't be able to just kind of look the other way. You'll have to gauge, engage in, in this war that we're in. Not a war of flesh and blood, but a, a war of principalities and powers and spiritual things. And you'll have to volunteer to be on the front lines when that truth of the gospel gets in you. And it will be complicated. I mean, I, I can't tell you if you're going to need to be a pacifist or not. I can't tell you if God will call you to do the killing or to do the dying. You'll have to hear from the Holy Spirit on that. All I can tell you is this. If you're a policeman, if you're a lawyer, if you're a prosecutor, if you're a defender, if you're a victim, if you're a soldier, and you have this at the heart of your life, then it's going to change the way. I'm not saying that it doesn't sometimes need to have force to stop evil but it's going to radically change the way you do it that's what I love about these first two films that have been directed by committed Christians if you get the truth of the gospel into who you are you still direct films but it changes the way you do it if you get the truth of the gospel into who you are, you still retire, but it changes the way you do it. If you get the truth of the gospel into who you are, you show up at the work on Monday to take the call, to meet the people, to do the task, but it changes the way you do it. If you know what the greater David did, the ultimate warrior, Jesus Christ, did for you. If you see him thirsting on the cross for you, then you'll break through any lines. You'll do any task. You'll handle any foe. And you'll finally be the warriors, the kind of warriors that the world needs. Not, to, not quick to kill, but quick to serve and to sacrifice. And to pour out your life for others. I can't give you a rule of what that looks like for you today or tomorrow when you head in for your next shift or into your next task. It's up to each of us to hear the Holy Spirit on what that is. For some of you, it, it may have nothing to do with the task. It may have to do with living according to a different kind of corporate culture. Where you're not clawing and grabbing and tearing down the person that may be ahead of you to get ahead. For some of us, it may be as simple as taking a shift when another person asks. For some of us, it's doing the thing that needs to be done before it's assigned and asked to be done. I mean, there's, there's, I, I, we can go on and on. There's all kinds of ways that this works out in our life. The amazing thing about Desmond Doss is that the gospel got into him so deeply that nothing, not persecution and book, boot camp, not the threat of beatdowns and, and court martials, not the horrors of war could remove the gospel and what it had done in his heart and what God had spoken to him through the gospel. Nothing could remove that. That's truly amazing. And the inspiration that I find in that 
is that I want the gospel to get that deeply into my heart. I want to see Christ that clearly on the cross for me that it changes everything about everything. 